You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan here in March of 2024 with episode 456 of The Corbett Report podcast, Navigating the River of Lies. Well, what does that title refer to? Well, in order to set that up, let's cast our mind back to last year when I released episode 448 of the Corbett Report podcast. You remember that one? Tell Lie Vision, in which I released the interview that was recorded in the process of the creation of a documentary by a documentary filmmaker who was interviewing me about media. And I went through the interview and I had that interview footage lying around and then... Never heard from that documentary filmmaker again, so I released the interview footage. (laughs) Well, also, for this edition of The Corporate Report, I'm going to be releasing interview footage that was recorded as part of a documentary film that uh, was recorded over a year ago at this point, actually, um, and which I am releasing sections of that interview today. But in this case, it's not that the documentary filmmaker just went away and I never heard about it again. In this case, the documentary has been released. I do know about it. And in fact, I just recently talked to the documentary filmmaker. I am talking about a documentary called The River of Lies about the New Zealand scamdemic. So people can find more information about this documentary first and foremost from the documentary web- website at riveroflies.co.nz and Z for my American listeners. And there you will find more information about this documentary, which is being released in three episode installments. The first episode has already been released, uh, is two hours long. The second one, I believe, is coming, or it may already be released by the time you're hearing these words. And the third one will be released in the near future. And yes, as part of the filming and creation of this documentary, um, Billy TK, who was the documentary filmmaker, did interview me last year. So we're going to watch some excerpts of that interview, specifically my responses to some of Billy's questions. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the documentary and set the table. So as people in my audience may or may not know, Billy TK, Billy Tikahika, aka Billy Billy TK, uh, is a musician turned political activist um, that people in New Zealand might know um, for his the coverage that his New Zealand political party um, gained in the 2020-2021 selection cycle over there in New Zealand. But uh, more importantly, he has been engaged in political activism surrounding the scamdemic and the erosion of rights and liberties in New Zealand, along with uh, previous Corbett Report guest Vinnie Eastwood um, for years now, and in fact was infamously arrested as part of a uh, protest that he organized in response to the New Zealand national lockdown in August of 2021, which we'll hear more about in a moment. So that is um, where this documentary is coming from. And what is it about? How did it come together? What is Billy TK and the team that he's put together hoping to do with this documentary? And where are they going from here? What is the situation like in New Zealand? Well, you don't have to take my word for any of that. You can listen to Billy TK himself. I recently had the chance to sit down and talk to him about this documentary, about uh, how it came together, what's happening, and where he is going from here, because it does not start and end with this documentary, as you might imagine. So let's listen to a bit of that interview before we get into my own um, responses to his questions. So let's listen to this part of the interview where I started by asking him about the documentary. What is it? How did it come together and what is it seeking to accomplish? Well, um, I'm very pleased to talk about the River of Lies because you're in it as well, James, and we did a great interview for that. But the River of Lies, New Zealand Scamdemic, it it is an investigative documentary documenting and capturing uh, the behaviour of the New Zealand Labour government under former Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and her response and her government's response to COVID-19. Now, New Zealand was the unfortunate um, member of a a group of countries that have been um, governed by former World World Economic Forum young global leaders like Macron. Uh, You've got Trudeau, of course. In Australia, you have Dan Andrews. 
But in New, in New Zealand, we had Jacinda Ardern, and the way that the her government responded to dealing with COVID-19 was something to behold. It really was. They created a whole new form of, of governance that was draconian that we'd never seen in New Zealand. And it was really important uh, that that story gets documented, it gets um, investigated, and the findings are told in a very calm manner uh, to expose what I think is a um, some very dastardly behaviour that's taken us into a potentially a new era of, of hum- human experience. Unfortunately, you are quite correct about that. As I've been documenting here for years, I know you've been doing research and interviews on this project for a while now. So what do you hope to achieve with this documentary? Number one, it's um, it, it's it's not only an ideological war, but it's also an info war, isn't it? And, you know, we, we may kind of sit back and throw our hands up in the air and say, well, the sleeping sheep will all never wake up. Um, but we, that doesn't mean we abandon them to to live in a life with their head in the sands. And so, what I believe the 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 goal that we want out of the documentary is to educate people, to wake them up that these some serious problems with the behaviour of governments that have a have a, a left leaning bias, but not only the left leaning bias, but the concerned with any extremism, regardless of the political spectrum you may sit, and that it appears that. Um, that there is that there have been crimes committed against humanity through the the whole COVID nineteen response, the creation of COVID nineteen as an epidemic pandemic, and then all the flow on um, laws that have been introduced, the loss of human rights and freedoms, especially in New Zealand. And so, I, I guess uh, in in simple response, it is to educate and wake people up, but also to expose those particular individuals that have participated in campaigns that have greatly destroyed our country, James. It's been it's been it's been shocking to see and it needed to be documented in a very precise way. And I think we've done that. Now, my international listeners might not know about you and your political experience there in New Zealand and the things that you have been doing over the past few years in in the midst of this scandemic craziness. For example, uh, the national lockdown that took place in August of 2021 there in New Zealand on the back of one case of transmission, or at least that's what the government was saying, um, was something that raised the ire of a number of people there in New Zealand. And you helped participate in a protest of that national lockdown there in August of 2021. Tell us about that experience and what resulted from it. Well, thank you for raising that. I was actually the organiser of a um, peaceful, very small peaceful protest against lockdowns. Now, um, I had led the largest civil uh, liberties concerned political party in 2020. It was gigantic. There's never been anything like it before and since then. And I was really, really concerned um, that I was hearing from people directly about people that had committed suicide because of lockdown anxiety. Um, people that were losing their businesses and wanting to commit suicide if they were going to lose any more, all those things. And really, I had a super-duper high profile, and I thought to myself, you know, they're locking us down again. They've already got the evidence that lockdowns don't work. We knew we knew by then, New Zealand, our New Zealand government knew by August 2021 that lockdowns didn't work. But what I had done in May, April, May, earlier in 2021, I had... Um, deduced, and I'm going to sound like Sherlock Holmes here, but I deduced that um, through government announcements that the COVID Pfizer commonality injection was being, was arriving in New Zealand around about um, late July, I, I deduced that they would lock New Zealand down in mid-August and blow my socks off. That's exactly what they did. And that was used as a measure to coerce and pressure people into, of course, rolling up their sleeves and taking this, this, this terrible experimental mRNA jab. And so what I did was that my pr- primary um, my primary consideration was around kids su- suicide and people just in general committing suicide, especially kids, because up until that point, James, we were having 100 kids a week in New Zealand rush to emergency rooms for attempted self-harm episodes. And um, so I made that fateful decision to stand up and speak and protest Um and as always for protests that I'm involved with, I work very closely with the police to make sure protesters, public and police, were safe, 
I had an operations plan, I had secured and all that, um, but they arrested me um, at the protest. I've got no criminal history whatsoever, no convictions, of course, and um, and I was locked up um, in our largest prison in New Zealand. They didn't want to let me out. I spent a day and a half in a prison called Mount Eden, and um, fortunately we had a bail court hearing, and my bail was opposed by the New Zealand police that I'd once been a member of, and um, but fortunately we did get um, we did get released, even though the bail conditions were extremely hard. A year later, I was found guilty of breaching a COVID-19 lockdown law, which they knew by then. A year later, that they there were some serious problems with that, and then four months later, I was sentenced to to uh, four months prison, which is the highest sentence given to anyone in New Zealand for peaceful protest. But fortunately, we appealed that, James, and I just found out this past December that the sentence had been quashed. I'm still convicted as a civil disobedient, um, terrible criminal who dared to challenge the government, uh, but they didn't imprison me. So that's been my last couple of years. But they've tried to get me in two ways. That's just one of the cases. It's It's been incredible, very sad. In two ways? What's the other way? Well, I'm glad you. That was a leading question to get you to leading statement to get you to ask that question. So the New Zealand government um, claimed that my uh, because I stood for election with my Civil Liberties Party in 2020, they claimed that I committed um, dishonesty and deception regarding donations, and of course I hadn't. There was no way I would. I'm a pastor. Um, my record dis- distantiates me as someone that has no propensity for, for any such thing and they put me through the ringer they, I was facing criminal charges which could have uh, meant up to seven years in prison they were, but believe it or not they said I was dishonest with $15,000 normally with with um, donations um, fraud you're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars if not millions etc I would have to be the worst criminal in the world to think I'm going to put myself at risk for that, you know, principles and honesty aside. Um, but fortunately, I found I was found not guilty on those criminal charges. They got me for keeping terrible records uh, because this party secretary didn't do a good enough job. But they were trying to to do to 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 get me for four criminal charges, and I got found innocent and dismissed on all of them. Isn't that lucky? Well, it certainly speaks to the political situation there. And as as you say, the the bail conditions that they set upon you uh, after your um, your arrest was just absolutely unprecedented, as far as I know, in the history of New Zealand political activism. And so, people who don't know about that can can um, research into that. I'll throw in some links to some information about that. But um, it does raise the specter, as you raised earlier here of Jacinda Ardern, the, of course, the Prime Minister of New Zealand during the depths of the scandemic, who, as my international audience may or may not know, is no longer the Prime Minister. In fact, now it's a new government under Christopher Luxon, which is taking a completely different tack, or so it seems. For example, as my listeners will know by now, the New Zealand government has uh, reserved against the WHO IHR amendments uh, that were passed uh, last year and has at least reserved the right for the New Zealand government to um, to make its own rulings on this, which might suggest that perhaps now you have a government in New Zealand who's going to stand up to the WHO globalist mafia. How off base is that assertion? Well, um, if you looked at the distance between us and uh, Alpha Centauri, it would probably, probably be a fair, <laughs> fair sort of comparison to the distance. Look, um, I was incredibly slandered throughout 2020 and 2021 by media here as a conspiracy nut job, right? And it couldn't have been anything further from the truth. I'm calm, I'm researched, I'm investigation and intelligence data and um, training um, involved in my co- former careers. And I did this with a with a very, very calm mind and a calm spirit, I guess you'd, I'd say. And... What I was saying back then in 2020, it didn't matter, in my view, whether we had a left-leaning government or a right-leaning government. That at the moment it was the term of it was the term of a extreme leftist Marxist government. That was the Jacinda Ardern government, 
And but I said, you watch it the next election, they'll do a high five, tag each other, and it'll be the, the team in blue that'll come in. Now, just about Jacinda Ardern, I mean, Jacinda Ardern, as your listeners, if they've studied or know anything about her, will know that she's she's a complete Marxist, she's a globalist, she's an elitist, and um, she took an extraordinary step in, in late 2019 to sign New Zealand up to full implementation of Agenda 2030. Now, you can't get any more work than that. So in New Zealand, we are, we have been burdened with, with uh, sustainable development goals throughout our councils, throughout our cities, and nationally, and it's it's killing our agricultural and horticulture sectors and all those flow and effects, education, all that. And what we had, of course, was the commitment by, made by the Jacinda Ardern government that we would be willing and able participants with WHO programs, especially in, in response to uh, the call to action to create a global lockstep response to pandemics. And I'm talking about that, of course, the global pandemic um, response framework. It's no longer a treaty, it's now a framework. And basically, um, our dunes destroyed New Zealand, morally destroyed us, fiscally, suicide, crime, you name it. We went down the socialist Googler and we have an absolutely destroyed country. Now, of course, what happens in the guys ride in on their white horses and the other team and they say that, hey, we're going to fix this country. We're coming in and we're going to, we're going to do all this great stuff. Now, our elections were in, were in October. We had um, the change of shift. We went from an extreme left, uh, extreme Marxist government. Now we've got a – meant to have a centre-right leaning conservative um, party, but they're not. I, I'm, I'm, I'm – I say this quite often, the government's changed, but nothing has changed. We are still a part of the climate change agendas. We are still um, willing participants in UN programs agenda 2030 and 50. We support the World Economic Forum programs. We have signed white papers for um, total AI regulation in New Zealand and the rollout, rollout thereof. We still have central bank digital currencies that our reserve bank, James, is now recruiting and employing managers for central bank digital currency rollout. This is advertised in mainstream media. But in direct response to your question, the national government that we have today under Christopher Luxon has a deputy prime minister called Winston Peters and a coalition partner in another party. His party is called New Zealand First. The coalition partner, additional to that, because he's three of them, is called the ACT Party. All three of them were completely for all of the measures that are doing um, employed during 2020, 21, and so on. But what they wanted were harsher measures. The former Deputy Prime Minister of 2020 is now our new Prime Minister today. And this is the same man that, put, that signed the New Zealand uh, COVID-19 Public Health Response Act into law, which robbed everybody of civil liberties. It suspended the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990. And basically he he antagonised people like you and me all throughout even the period when he was dismissed out of out of Parliament because he last, lost the last election. So these players that we have in today, they've not changed anything. Now, this, this day of reserving a judgment about whether they will support the International Health Regulations um, 2005 amendments um, to me, is a is a is a placating strategy where they're just going to settle everybody and make everybody go back to sleep and think, oh wow, we it's all good. But the fact is, they they're still pushing the envelope around these international programs, um, and something that is a real big giveaway. The same former uh, deputy prime minister who was he signed the COVID laws into law, who is in the same role today. He's just introduced this new bill, and listen to this and pay attention. This new bill is a bill that forces our our pharmaceutical regulator, it's a New Zealand government agency called MedSafe, is forcing them to approve all drugs within 30 days if two international recognised partners pre-approve those drugs. How about that? Isn't it unbelievable? So now our regulator has got 30 days to approve all drugs. If if uh, the CDC and FDA say 
that's a good mRNA drug, give it to the kids, they've got to do it in 30 days. If Imagine this, imagine the WHO and Gavi, who are recognised authorities, they approve something. So I think what we've seen here really is no change and really, I always say this, it's the, the devil in pink or the devil in blue, doesn't matter. Behind the scenes, the devil's still pulling the strings. So I hope that kind of, as succinctly as I can, can spoil our spoil our, our dreams and wishes that it was all different. Well, as a uh, committed voluntarist, I certainly don't place much faith in politicians at the best of times. But yeah, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, unfortunately not very surprising. But it does raise the question then, well, okay, so the political side of this is not the solution, at least in, in this form at this time through these parties, then what is the solution? And I understand that you're working on something called the New Zealand Citizen COVID-19 Inquiry at NZ, nzcci.com. Tell us a little bit about this inquiry, what it is, what you're putting together, what you hope to accomplish with it. Yeah, thank you, James. Again, you are a me what we call a media expert witness as well. Um, and and so through my, uh, my, my stance, I took a stance against the COVID narrative in, in March 2020. So it's four years this month. And throughout that entire period until we are now, I've been continually investigating the, the scenario of of what's actually, what are we going through? Why, who, how, what for, where is this leading? And then it pretty much became clear to me that that there were some, that there were crimes being con committed here. I'm not going to play around and say, I think that these crimes committed here. I'm pretty sure the, the, there are crimes that have been committed against the citizens of New Zealand and the world in regards to this matter. So about... Um, about a year ago, I started twirling around my brain that really there needed to be an inquiry into the behaviour of the New Zealand Labour government and its uh, during the, the pandemic era and its response. Why did it make certain decisions? Why did it act in a certain way? How did they get to a place where they approved a never-before-used drug like an mRNA drug that had gene therapy aspects to it? How did they get to a place where they trusted a corporate career criminal like Pfizer to give them the data to say that their own product is the next thing, best thing since sliced bread, and what led them to that point of accepting that and then rushing that into the arms of New Zealanders. I wanted to to understand how they got to that, that place. I wanted to investigate it, and I thought, well, the best way to do this is to do a, a high-profile, transparent, clear everything out in the open um, citizen inquiry into this issue. Now, our brothers and sisters in Canada have just completed the national COVID inquiry there, and um, I'm working with uh, Ted Kuntz and Sean Buckley, who uh, Ted is now the chairman of that wonderful organisation. Of course, Sean Buckley is counsel there. So what we've done is I brought in the world's leading thinkers about this issue, expert witnesses, New Zealand witnesses, of course, doctors, lawyers, um, scientists, people that have been hurt, harmed, vaccine, injured, you know, had um, uh, lost their businesses because of lockdown, social distancing, all of that stuff. And what we're going to do over the next few months, we're going to compile this evidence together into a case summary file. Once we get to that point, we're going to have our own New Zealand legal team review the, the material that we've got. From there, we're not going to take it into the New Zealand judiciary system straight away. We're going to take it offshore and we're going to attempt to get offshore tribunals and other experts like Lord something to review what we've got and give the, give us a legal opinion about whether we've got a case that will st stack up. Now, the experts that I've got in my investigation team, I'm one of them, um, we've got you know, policeman, 32 years experience, 24 years of being an investigator, another man. We've got another guy that's joining us, to, um, another investigator that's just come on board today and confirmed he's an ex-New Zealand military man, 21 years a New Zealand Army officer who then went to work for the UN, and he's got a, he's got some fantastic insights. He finished working with them in late 2019, so he's very, very current. Um but the end net result that we want is that we want to take action, court action in two ways, civil litigation and a group criminal complaint against people that that may have, and as we allege, committed crimes against the New Zealand people. So it's a it, it's a big, big project. It's 
going to be publicly funded. Uh, we're not going to get any grants from the New Zealand government. But the strange thing is, James, is that the New Zealand government in initiated um, what they call the Royal Commission of Inquiry about a year ago. And this Royal Commission of Inquiry is being chaired by a man who wrote the response measures for Melbourne, for Victoria, an epidemiologist called Tony Blakely, who's a member of Otago University, who's received funding from the government for COVID. He's received um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funding, so you know the picture, so on and so forth. So that inquiry has been, has got 17 um, points to the terms of reference. There's a new inquiry that this new government has just announced, and it's been looked over, um, put in place by the Deputy Prime Minister who signed all these terrible laws in place in 2020. And the terms of reference as points have, has about 23, 24 points so far in it. But it's been chaired and ran by a, one of the ministers from the ACT Party, a minister called Brooke Van Valden, and she is an, a member of a party that's incredibly pro-COVID vaccination in the whole narrative. So what we've said is that's not going to do. If you believe that, you might as well believe in, in the Easter Bunny. And so what we have to do to get to get to the tr to get to the truth is is to commit to our own citizen inquiry. The slogan for our inquiry is truth, justice, and then reconciliation. Until we get that, then there's no there's no reconciliation. And the last point I want to make just quickly: it's not about just shining the light on what we've been through. We all know about that. It's about holding them those people accountable for the harms, but it's about shining a great big spotlight on what's coming down the pipeline. That's now very, very the most important thing of all. Once again, that is Billy T. Kahika, a.k.a. Billy TK, the creator of the new River of Lies documentary at riveroflies.co.nz and also the founder of the New Zealand COVID citizen, sorry, citizen COVID-19 inquiry at nzcci.com, and you can go there for more information. Specifically, if you are interested in this documentary and the type of information that it presents, you can get a good sense of that from the River of Lies homepage um, that will be linked up in the show notes if you do need the link. And from there, you can see the trailers and the various sneak peeks of the documentary, or you can purchase the full documentary itself. But let's get into some of the that interview footage that, as I say, was recorded for this documentary. It was a it was a big, long, wide-ranging, hour-long interview, and so I just want to take a couple of clips from that interview to present to you um, to show at least some of the material that the documentary delves into. And the first excerpt that we're going to be listening to today is uh, from a point of the interview where Billy is asking me about Bill Gates who not only was ubiquitous in, say, the American side of the scamdemic, which is logical enough, but, of course, internationally, and, of course, with his various linkages into the New Zealand government as well. So Billy did ask me about Bill Gates, and how and where and why did he become the spider seemingly at the center of the scamdemic web, at least in the early stages of the scamdemic, a topic which, as you may or may not know, I have quite a bit to say about. I think actually Bill Gates is probably the perfect window into the larger COVID narrative and understanding what has happened over the past few years, precisely because he is a, a pretty much universally known figure at this point and uh, has been at the top of the Forbes richest list of richest people in the world for decades now. People know Bill Gates. He's a known quantity, or they think they do at any rate. And what was he known for in the 1990s? Um, people these days, I've met younger people who don't even know this, but yes, 19, in ni the 1990s, Bill Gates was reviled as a tech monopolist who was a cutthroat businessman um, who used cutthroat business practices to maintain his uh, and expand his Microsoft empire slash monopoly, um, and who was, of course, actually sued by the U.S. government and uh, went through an antitrust case on that point and did not have a, enjoy a very uh, good public profile, shall we say. Um, and somehow, over the past couple of decades, he's been transformed into Saint Bill, who is some sort of public health guru who has incredible, enormous power over the public health space. How did that happen exactly? Well, ka-ching, ka it happened through billions and billions and billions of dollars being directed into various 
philanthropic causes. And uh, as a result of that, we have seen the building up of this entire public health infrastructure, this global public health infrastructure, uh, largely on the back of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and its various tentacles, because it's not only the foundation itself, um, it's also the Foundation Trust, which is a separate financial uh, vehicle through which um, Bill and, well, his ex-wife at this point, um, were able to invest in some of the very businesses that were directly affected by the grants that were being given by their philanthropic foundation. Um, there's even, I mean, this has been widely talked about and identified for some time now as philanthrocapitalism. And some people have tried to frame this as a good thing because, oh, it's the using the innovation of the capitalist system, but, and, and you know, trying to get profit is a good way of encouraging people to get better outcomes. And, oh, he can make some money while he's helping to save the world, something along those lines. But there have been people quietly and sometimes not so quietly, trying to ring the alarm bell on the growing, essentially, exactly as Bill Gates did in the tech space in the 80s and 90s, well, it's what he's been doing in the public health space for the past couple of decades, essentially monopolizing the space and taking it over for his own benefit and his own ends. And we can look at that most obviously through the financial links and the financial benefits. So for it, just as one example, one way into this story, you could take a look at the fact that Gates was directly invested in and, and uh, uh, giving grants to Moderna for the past five, six, seven years now, um, since at least 2016, when again, Moderna didn't even have a prototype of a possible candidate for some actual injection slash vaccine, um, and had obviously never brought anything to market, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was there pumping millions and millions and millions of dollars into this company. And Gates, uh, through his Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, which he helped co-found and which the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation heavily invests in, um, has created the market uh, a healthy market for vaccine manufacturers is actually part of their their mission statement. Um, and they have done exactly that. And we've seen Bill Gates on the sort of international circuit at Davos and other places um, pimping the idea of this incredible new technology, vaccine technology, mRNA, etc. He's been talking about this for a number of years. And lo and behold, 2020 comes along. And the first thing, the first thing that we started hearing about in the as soon as this pandemic emergency hit and all of these um, uh, 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 politicians and others were telling us about the dangers of what was coming. The very first thing they started talking about was vaccines, which is extremely unusual considering the fact that in previous history, there had never been a vaccine. I think the the quickest that had ever been come, come to market was something like seven years of development. Um, but Suddenly we were hearing, oh, there's going to be a vaccine and probably within the next year and it will save us from this pandemic. Um, again, of course, all of that was just convenient blather, but convenient blather that obviously benefited Moderna, for example, for in whom Bill and Melinda Gates are invested, but other companies like that besides the pharmaceutical manufacturers. So we start to see the connections and how they how they play out in various functions. Um, one other example, not only Imperial College, which you mentioned with Niall Ferguson, um, creating the models that sent the UK and then the US into lockdown panic, but also uh, a Seattle-based um, organization, which given its proximity to Bill uh, Bill Gates geographically, as you can might be able to guess, uh, was itself essentially founded and and uh, t funded, I think, to the tune of something like $270 million by Bill Gates. The IMHE, and I'm not going to remember what that acronym stands for off the top of my head, but that was another of these metric modeling um, uh, 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 research think tanks that produced a number of um, scary scenarios of the way that this could play out if people didn't lock down, if they didn't mask up, if they didn't follow the health authorities' uh, injunctions, there was going to be a massive problem. So uh, Bill Gates, again, multiple tentacles in multiple different places, not to mention all of the media fun, uh, funding that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been doing over the past couple of decades, um, funding various media outlets, BBC and others, to the tunes of millions of dollars to, in some cases, to create entire public health, global public health units to, to report on the types of things that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are doing. Do you think they are going to report negatively on the people who are literally funding their research teams? Probably not. And so, again, 
People have been talking about this problem for a number of years now, but it became quite evident the way that this can be wielded, uh, the amount of power that is um, that resides in someone like Bill Gates, who is that thoroughly connected and has that many connections, becomes evident in times of crisis. So the easiest way to understand what's unfolding is a sort of monetary swindle. Well, Bill Gates is just directing things so that they will play out in a way that benefit his direct financial interests. And I think that's demonstrably true, um, as we see with Moderna and and Pfizer and these other uh, pharmaceutical companies and the types of money they're making. But I think it goes beyond simply the monetary incentive. And that's where we start to see, again, you could use Gates as a good example of this because his tendrils extend in many directions, including into the idea of digital IDs. And he has been talking for some time about how digital identification systems can be coupled to uh, national national uh, ID and social security systems and vaccination and how all of these things can come together in a program that will uh, essentially collect everyone's biometric details, put them on a digital ID grid and make sure that they get their vaccines when they need to t- take their vaccines. And uh, his he was indirectly involved with and has uh, connections to the uh, Indian biometric ID scheme that uh, has unfolded in the past decade um, that has now over a billion people in their biometric database and is pioneering this idea of connecting all services, tax, taxation and vaccines and everything else that you go to the government for will be through this biometric ID that is issued by the government. In India's case, it's called Adhar, but it's coming to every country in on the planet. And Bill Gates has been talking about that and promoting it. So I think we start to see that this isn't just about money. This is about real control, power that is being wielded over large swaths of the human population on the back of this promise of global public health. And when it is framed in that way, it's very difficult to argue in dissent. Are you against public health? Well, that, of course, no, I, I like health. But what what is health? Who gets to define health? And under what circumstances can we say we are healthy or we are not healthy? Whoever gets to decide what health is really gets to decide what all of these interventions, the direction in which they trend. And that's where um, some really disturbing things are coming about. For example, as you say, the World Health Organization is working on developing a international health regulation amendments and or some sort of treaty or device for a global pandemic uh, agreement. And of course, Bill Gates sitting there in the background talking about, we need global pandemic firefighter response teams that will be able to jump into any country at any time and deliver vaccines or whatever else we deem necessary. So he's uh, puppeteering that as well. Um, But uh, on the back of that, they're also trying to insert language about this new concept or new-ish concept of One Health, which is the idea that Your health is, of course, not just your health, and it's not just the health of your community, which you are now personally responsible for, but it's also the environment and and nature and all of these things. And in order to restore balance, we may have to we may have to herd the human population into small enclaves where you won't be able to go out and disturb nature and you'll have to live with less and less resources. So obviously we'll have to ration. And and one can see how taking that definition of what health is and expanding it out expands the uh, ability for authoritarians to gain control over the human population and the way people are living their lives. And again, all, although this might have sounded outlandish a few years ago, I understand. At this point, uh, you would need a considerable lack of wisdom to be able to not extend what we have seen over the last few years into the coming years and to, to see the way authoritarians are lusting after this power. All right, we'll stop that clip there. That was a section of the interview that Billy TK conducted with me for his River of Lies documentary. And as I alluded to before we started watching that clip, yes, the subject of Bill Gates and his connection to the COVID scamdemic agenda specifically, and the globalist agenda generally, is something that I have quite a bit to say about, because if you're new to the Corporate Report, you may not know that I created the Who is Bill Gates documentary in one breathless, ridiculous, headlong rush in the month of May 2020 with 
video editor extraordinaire Brock West by my side. We worked around the clock for one month of exhaustive work to get that documentary out in time for it to be relevant. And thankfully, it did get quite a bit of notoriety at the time and was probably the last million plus view documentary I'll ever create, given that I've been scrubbed from GooTube for the crime of telling the truth about the scandemic. But anyway, um, if you are new to The Corbett Report, or if you haven't seen that documentary yet, or if you haven't seen it in a while, you might want to brush up on the specifics, because I have a lot more to say about Gates and his various connections and how they do provide that window into the larger story of what's happening around us, along with, as always, tons and tons and tons of extensive documentation and links to back up everything that I am saying. So if you are interested in that, please go to CorbettReport.com slash Gates, and there you can watch the entire documentary completely for free. You can download and listen to the audio. You can read through the hyperlinked transcript with all of the references. Um, that was a lot of work, so I hope people do appreciate that and help to spread that work as well. And of course, you can also, if you are interested, purchase a physical copy of the DVD of Who is Bill Gates from the NewWorldNextWeek.com store. But having said that, let's move on to another short clip from that interview that was conducted for the River of Lies documentary. Uh, as I say, it was a wide-ranging interview. Well, it touched on a lot of different subjects, and I have seen episode one of this documentary. I have not yet seen episode two or three, so I don't know exactly which clips and which bits will be included, but we talked about Gates's depopulation agenda and the Malthusian mindset of the eugenicists. We talked about the WHO and its role in directing and puppeteering the scandemic and what may or may not be coming next. We talked about the technocratic ideals, ideas and ideals of the would-be rulers of the world and the system that they are bringing about and putting into place um, digitally uh, through digital ID and otherwise. And we then Billy asked me about a, a very interesting question about the fourth industrial revolution, as it is called, by Klaus Schwab, and whether that should be more aptly titled The Fourth Reich. Uh, that would be an apt way of phrasing it. And in fact, there are historical reasons for framing it in that way. Um, something that a lot of people do not know is that in the waning days of the Third Reich, there were uh, meetings that were being held by people that were high up in German finance and industry talking about how they could essentially perpetuate the uh, ideas of the Third Reich into the post war era, as they saw the writing on the wall in 1944, 1945, and they knew they were not going to win the war. How could they continue to propagate these ideas? And one of them, uh, one of the strands of that resulted in the development of something called the Bilderberg Group, which uh, unfortunately a lot of people do not know about, but was formed in the 1950s as a very, very exclusive, very high-level talking shop of royalty, financiers, businessmen, politicians, uh, that would meet together about 125 or so every year in a major national capital in Europe or North America um, to discuss essentially the future of the world and how they want to shape it. It sounds like something like Davos and World Economic Forum, but Davos is a public event. Thousands of people attend. You can buy your way into Davos. But Bilderberg is not that. It was always an exclusive invitation-only event that was only to about 125 or so people. And for decades and decades, its existence was denied to the general public. People who brought it up were dismissed as conspiracy theorists until a, uh, a, a persistent and growing online alternative media not only documented its, its existence, but really forced the issue into the mainstream. And now Bilderberg actually has its own website in which they announce the uh, the meeting every year and give a list of attendees that we can't really verify or check because they close down the hotel and the surrounding area with security. They don't let anyone in or out, etc. So uh, it's, it's, again, it remains that type of talking shop. But Actually, Bilderberg had its origins in the very same conversations and ideas about how to extend essentially the Third slash Fourth Reich. Um, from its inception, Bilderberg was talking about and working towards the formation of a European Union. And even uh, the former head of the European Central Bank um, admitted back, I believe, in 1999 that the euro itself 
was hatched at Bilderberg. That idea was hatched and it was uh, brought to fruition through Bilderberg and Bilderberg attendees. So yes, there is a direct historical linkage we can see between the Third Reich slash Fourth Reich of this globalist system that's been uh, uh, essentially taking over swaths of the globe for the past uh, half century at least. Um, but more to the point, fundamentally, this is this is a fascist idea at, in the real meaning of that word of the co- combination of corporation and the state. And that is essentially what we're seeing. But that is, amazingly enough, what people have always understood to be fascism, what Mussolini said should rightly be called corporatism. Uh, That idea has been long vilified, but now it's being resurrected, essentially, on the back of a new term, global public-private partnership. And this is being framed as a good thing. And the United Nations and all these international organizations are working with corporations in order to develop sustainable development systems and take over various natural resources so that they can better steward over them, all in the name of saving the planet. And somehow, people don't see it for what it is on its face, the combination of corporate private interests with public, supposedly public um, officials and and national governments. Um, Until people really wake up to what this agenda is and how it is rolling out and why it should be opposed by the vast majority of people, Unfortunately, until that happens, we have little hope. But my hope lies in the fact that I do think there are many, many more people that are aware of this agenda now than there was a few years ago before they really started pressing this in- insane agenda on the public. So I, I think the harder they press, the closer they get to the goal, the more people will rise up against it. And that's where I think we have to concentrate our, our attention. All right, we will leave that interview clip there. But if you are interested in more information about the, for example, the Fourth Reich origins of the Bilderberg Group that I alluded to there, you might want to check out my speech that I delivered to the We the People Anti-Bilderberg Conference back in 2014, which was released as episode 291 of the Corporate Report podcast, Why We Must Oppose Bilderberg in which I had plenty more to say on that subject and on the origins of Bilderberg and where it came from and what it actually does and how it functions and lots of documentation to back all of that up as usual. So you can find out more information about that specifically there. But at any rate, I trust that by this point in today's exploration, uh, you have a sense of what this River of Lies documentary might be interested in and talking about. Not just tightly focused on the scandemic itself or the New Zealand government's response to it, although there is plenty of information in that regard on that. And I can attest to the fact that in episode one of the River of Lies uh, documentary, it has the most thorough compendium that I've seen yet um, put together of politicians saying, uh, for example, on the uh, no no need for masks, masks don't do anything, you don't want to wear a mask, to the flipping of that script, uh, the most thorough compendium of politicians going back on their word that I have seen yet collected. So that may be worth it for the the, the price of admission for that alone. But at any rate, um, there's a lot of information specifically, yes, about the scamdemic agenda, but more broadly speaking about the agenda and how it fits into what is coming down the pipeline, um, which is essentially the theme of everything that I talk about at the Corbett Report and the general uh, attempt and thrust to bring in the technocratic global government generally. So you know you know about that story. So if you want more information, of course, the River of Lies documentary might be up your alley and I would invite you to at least check out the link. Having said all of that, I will leave the last word to Billy TK from our interview um, recently and On that note, I think I'm going to leave it here for today. Thank you for joining me for another edition of the Corporate Report Podcast, and I look forward to talking to you in the near future. Here's Billy TK answering the question about the River of Lies documentary and the New Zealand COVID citizen inquiry and how people can find more information about that. And any final words from Billy TK? Look, people are more than welcome to contact me directly. I have a great international contact base. Um, if they'd like to email me, they can at b i w l y billy at n n sorry let me say it again billy at nzcci dot com. That's billy at nzcci dot com. But if you want to go and check out the the film uh, and the documentary, which is part of this is episode one, part of four, 
episodes, um, they can go to riveroflies.co.nz. That's riveroflies.co.nz. And again, if they want to know more about the inquiry, they can go to nzcci.com. That's the easiest way. To, but I, I look forward to people reaching out to me. I love hearing from other people around the world and hearing their perspective, James. Excellent. Well, I'm sure you will hear from some in the audience. And Billy, are there any final messages that you have for anything, any, anyone out there or anything you'd like to say about um, the work that you're doing and where, how we proceed forward? Well, I think the number one is, is, is be certain that, um, that if you are concerned with the loss of your freedoms and your civil liberties, be certain that you're not a nut job conspiracy theorist. It is happening. What we are seeing, what we are observing is exactly the way it is happening. Be strong, remain resolute in your right to live according to your conscience as God gave us that, that right of freedom of choice. I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian man, and I believe that that civil liberty and the right to choose is the very basic gift that God has given all of humanity. You have a right to defend it for yourself, for your children, for your friends, for your grandchildren, and never ever allow anyone to rob you of your commitment to standing up in your freedom that was given by God and paid for at such a high price. Stay strong. Amen. Billy TK, thank you for your time. You're more than welcome. And thank you so much. It's a great honor, James. I follow you regularly. I'm a great fan. And to be here today is a great honor. Thanks so much.